welcome to this interior design business webinar. My name is Jeff Hayward and today with my co-presenter Susie Rumbold of Tasuta Interiors we're taking you on a lighting journey inside a grade one listed home in London with the help of Sally Story, creative director at John Cullen Lighting. We've scheduled this webinar to be a one hour conversation and we welcome you to take part by using the chat function for questions. We will endeavour to answer as many of those questions as we can during the webinar or in our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. There is quite simply nothing about lighting design that Sally's story does not know. I can remember being blown away by Sally's expertise at a seminar I attended on lighting, designing with light way, way back in 1996 when her company, John Cullen Lighting, was based in tiny premises on the Fulham Palace Road in central London. Interior designers and their clients often underestimate the importance of lighting. Put simply, it seems senseless to spend time, energy and a shed load of money designing and installing really beautiful interiors if you cannot see them. So today, Sally is going to take us on a journey through one of her fabulous projects. Welcome, Sally. Well, thank you very much. Um, without further ado, I will um, introduce you to my project that I want to share with you today. It's a grade one listed building in Regent's Park, 7,000 square feet, and it had six beds. And the interior designer was Louise Bradley. Uh, um, just before we st just before we go on, I I've heard that heritage spaces can be particularly difficult to light because I know you're not allowed to disturb or alter any of the original fabric of the building. Um, I know though that that's not just what John Cullen does. You you do lots and lots of contemporary stuff as well. You, in fact, you design um, lighting for every imaginable type of new indoor and outdoor space as well as as well as heritage projects. So. Yes, we do. I think sometimes I think of it that we do lighting for anything. And I love the challenges of every single project. One of the, one of the reasons I to, um, chose the idea of a heritage project was the fact that it has so many constraints, but there are also so many solutions. And I wanted to help guide you with those solutions. And I've also, within the presentation, introduced what I call a few wild cards of a few contemporary spaces just to show how those same solutions could be applied there. And the whole idea is that you're meant to take away and be inspired by light and have a whole vocabulary of ideas you might never have thought about. Even from just looking at this opening slide where you see the bookcase is lit, the fireplace uplit gives you that focus. And I think it makes all the difference. Now, one of the things that I think, um, as you were saying with heritage buildings is what they're really concerned about is you not damaging the fabric of the building. And therefore they're wanting to try and res keep restored anything that is traditional and original, and particularly with a grade one listed building. And in this build project, there was a combination that we were allowed to do nothing in the primary space rooms that would be disruptive. But there were certain areas where we are, were able to introduce ideas because they were new infill bits. For example, even in this door architrave where you see the two down lights, that was new as was the shelving. And so was the hearth of the fireplace. Had that been the original hearth, I wouldn't have been able to uplight. It looks amazing, Sally. I can't wait to see inside. What, what have you got for us so now? I'm just going to... Sorry. Hallway and staircase. I thought we'd just guide you to the building. So at each time when I'm looking at a different area, I'm showing you the plan that I'm looking at. So we're going to sort of walk and talk. So walk and talk sounds a good idea to me. I thought I'd start with the front door because one of the things I always say is first impressions count. So here we weren't able to put anything into the ceiling. So we've got a lantern in the center of the hall that is over the table. We've actually used uplights because the floor was new that uplit the architraves that take you into the different rooms. And even that single architrave on those two windows, either side of that main door, help I'd give added interest to the actual architectural design, the sh shutter boxes and the architraves. And had you in that hallway just had the central pendant and the wall lights, there would have been a flatness because there would be no layering of light. And one of the things that we didn't do in this that I would have liked to have done, you can see the flowers on the right-hand side just below the lantern. 
it would have been nice to have focused on them. I've just taken a different project where here we had two small LED spotlights either side of the lantern, so they were surface mounted because one couldn't recess, that actually lit those flowers. And then you see the box beyond. And you can see how building up on layers like that adds a whole lot of difference. So was that because you weren't allowed to put lights into the ceiling in that hallway that you were unable to achieve this particular effect? That was one of the reasons. And there was worriness about whether we should put the surface mounted lights. And I think they wouldn't have shown and at one stage, we were looking at trying to design in, in the base of the lantern, a little LED itself. But sometimes the project progresses, the choice of lantern means it was impossible. And that's why I added this other shot, because whereas I, it's lovely this, but I think the flowers underneath the lantern lose a bit. But if I could have just brought this effect to the flowers, it would have given you a stronger focus. It's a really welcoming look, isn't it? It just makes you feel like you're home. And I think it's those little touches in lighting. So you don't have to do too much. It's the little touches that make the difference. So as you go through this hallway, the hallway was one of those sensitive areas where you weren't allowed to put any lights in the ceiling that would have looked as if it was a contemporary addition. So the idea of at each level doing the up lights and the wall lights made a difference because even with that you've got a layering of light if we just had the wall lights there which would have been the traditional solution you'd have lost the architrave and lost that other little element of lighting that even at night becomes like a night light so when you're talking about layering of light are you talking about lighting at different areas because you've got kind of lights low down and you've got kind of lights in the middle and then obviously the pendants are at the top is is that is that what you're referring to i think you um in fact, leaving it on this, I think that it's a subject that I'll bring up through different images okay. because the layering to me is a bit like, the analogy to me is like the architect plays with textures. He might go for a very smooth stone, then a textured stone, or then it might be a terrazzo and a polished stone. And so does the interior designer use those materials, but then might have silk and velvet and linen together. And in a way, what you're doing is layering your materials and I'm doing the same thing with light. I was also on the same theme as staircases, was this was a staircase going down from another project that I worked on with Louise Bradley in her home. And I loved the way that the stairs to the basement were different. They were a new staircase, therefore a different sort of lighting treatment was used. I thought often you see the stair lights, but I rather loved the way that this separated the stairs from the wall and gave a very different solution. But again, in terms of layering, as you bring it up, you've got your visual focus of the wall lights. If that was the only light, the scheme would be really flat. There is a narrow beam that highlights the center of the table. And then in the mirror behind, you're seeing reflected the rather architectural effect of the lighting of the stairs to the basement. They almost look like they're floating. I know, so it's rather wonderful. And I think being a lighting designer, I'm trying to forever use my tools and reinvent the way of using them. I also thought on this theme of staircases, because I often think that the circulation staircase is the spine of the building. It's the place that interconnects all the other rooms. And once I was told, oh, forget about dimming in the staircase. And I said, to me, it's the spine. It's the way you move between spaces. And it should be able to be considered as much and have as much involvement and in design and dimming potential. I chose this image. This is from a country house where a different solution had been to light the staircase in that it had a large well in the center of the staircase but the size of that well changed at different levels. So we used three different pendants from the top that were hung on chains to different levels. And it was that ambience that helped light the stairs, but added interest was given, you can see by uplighting the window boxes and then the wall lights. And that helped give that little architectural element, as you can see how the shutter boxes are emphasized. And then it's a bit of glow on the underside of the stairs. And you've got that layering with wall lights, pendant and up lights, but you've made that staircase come alive. Mm. And this was in a very narrow hall. Another example, I think it's worth thinking that so many halls aren't like the original one, which was a much wider one. 
was that they're narrow spaces. You could have hanging lanterns there. But here, the wall lights help you give that mid-level. But it's actually, here we were allowed to recess, was the directional lights that add the glamour onto the flowers and the clock. But you could have achieved that effect with a very small surface mounted light. And later on in my presentation, I put an image of one so that it'll help you identify with what I'm discussing. So is surface mounted lights permissible then in these listed buildings? You can, it's just that you're not allowed to cut into the, into the ceiling. Is that what I'm understanding? I said, I think that in many respects, it's, they don't want to see, they feel that recessed down lights are a modern intervention. Oh, yes, okay. Sometimes I've known them allow speakers and burglar alarms. And I feel what's, you shouldn't even allow those when you're protecting the fabric. And in certain situations, you can't. But I find that each officer in each area translates the rules in different ways. So in a way, it's the luck of the draw, I suppose. I think it is. But I think that by having a surface mounted, they cannot complain because the surface mounted, you know, you could say that isn't a traditional lantern and you have a very modern one. And you can, as you can suspend a pendant, so too should you be able to surface mount a light. I thought that coming in from the hallway, we'd now go into the kitchen. And you can see from that hallway, the same up lights introduce you into the space because that was a new build office. because on either side as you come into the kitchen are the tall cabinets. We were able to incorporate a down lighter into that element. But I love the fact that the layers of light continue and you're drawn in to the pendants over the island. But the island itself, just like in a restaurant or bar, we've incorporated a linear light underneath that will give light to the fabric on the chairs, but also give you that lower level light that is catching the floor. And here you can see it again. And this is looking fabulous in that, again, this was a speaker. You allowed the speaker, but no down lights. So there is the contradiction. But here we kept the pendants over the island, the low level linear and lighting the chairs, the wall lights are mid-level. But what we've done with the very modern units is we've built a shelf above. Do you see that that allows us to have an up light that gives an indirect brightness to the space. It also allows us to have the small down lights that adds a task element and lights the front of the cabinets. And we've also got a linear light that basically is under the cabinets in contrast to that that gives you a proper task lighting. So, so you've just kind of outlined that the lights within this space actually all have different functions. Some of them are, are accent and some of them are task and some of them are ambient. Just for the benefit, I suppose, of people watching, do you want to just define those three terms, ambient, accent and task? Well, the way that I'm always thinking in a room, I've introduced the concept of layers of lighting, but also you think of how to light the space. The ambient light could also be called the general light. It's the way you give the main lighting to the space. It's not giving the accent, it's making the space bright. So in this instance, it's the up lighting above the cabinets and to a certain extent, the wall lights and the pendants when they're on full. The pendants also have a secondary function and they're also lighting the island and they're giving an ambience. And because they've got shades on them, the ambience is quite soft. The feature lighting is when you're introducing another level of light. So the front lighting of the cabinet is featuring the cabinets, but is also giving an additional boost of task lighting. And the feature lighting is also in this instance, the lighting underneath the island, which is also bringing the upholstery of those bar stools. The true task lighting is the linear lighting underneath the cabinets that is there for a task. But in most, mostly I would also use that as an element when we dim the lighting, and this is another thing, it is still very dramatic. And if you look at the scheme, I've introduced another layer with the up lighting of the shutter boxes that wasn't as obvious in the first slide because the ambience was brighter. But when we dim the ambient lighting, the shutter box becomes brighter. But the also under your under cabinet light is really accenting that beautiful marble splashback. And I think that's, that was the concept. So what you do when you dim the lighting is you create a totally different mood 
So when you dim, it's not like making everything 100% to 50% to 25%. And if that's how it's done, it's probably done wrongly. I've had to use and control each of these light sources independently. So, go on. I was just, no, I was just going to say, so, so how, how do you go about controlling the lights to create these complex effects? So I've got a preset lighting system in this situation. What I like to think when you go into a room is how many light sources? I get a lot of people thinking, do I have to have a complicated control or don't I? My rule of thumb is that if you get beyond three rotary dimmers, you're in trouble with actually controlling moods separately because can you imagine a bank of six trying to push them on, rotating them each time? And wouldn't it be much easier that that was done and at a touch of a button, the mood perfectly controlled. Take this example where we have the pendants on one, the wall lights on another, and it's important they're separate because the wall lights are bare light sources through a glass shade compared to the ones that have a, a sort of linen shade. So obviously when you're dimming them, they dim to different levels. Also then you've got the under cabinet light You've got the down lights lighting each of the cabinets that are three watt, whereas the up lights are one watt. If they were dimmed together, that would mean that the one watts would go out first. So I probably got six different channels here. So by presetting it, I can actually determine the level I want each to be. So at the touch of a button, I change the mood. Mm. One question I've got from uh, Susie in the q and I think referring back to uh, what you were doing in the hallway, was when you're using floor lighting, how do you stop that shining in people's eyes as they're walking about? Well, we um, have designed the Luca. The Luca was named after my eldest daughter. <laughs> and it's a 10, it's, we go under 10 degrees and we also have a glare guard that will cut off the side lighting. So as you walk past, the side lighting can be cut off by the glare guard, so it only uplights the architrave uh, or limits the light. Yeah. So a lot of up, you've got the idea of being narrow beam, it has to be 10 degree and less to avoid the glare. If it's any more, then you get the problems. So it's choosing the light, right light source. The other thing is that if you've got an uplight, we've actually recessed the light source well within the fitting. So it's at least 30 mil below the glass or 20, uh, yeah, 25 miles, so you're not seeing the light source itself directly. And those are the important attributes in any light fitting. I would never use a down light where the light source was on the surfaces of the fitting, because then visibly you see the light source as the brightest point rather than what you're lighting being the brightest point. Good, great. There's a lot to think about. <laughs> then, um, I just, this is one of my wild cards in the thing was, you'd, you'd look at the effects of linear here, but those same effects can be translated to a very contemporary scheme. So here we've got, do you see how instantly the up light under that cabinet, the linear to light down over the orange, almost like RSJ sort of shelf, the linear under the floating island and under the whole thing, how different we've created the place and not a, traditional wall light. Here we've got a very contemporary one that floats over the island. And I just rather love the idea of how once you've got your vocabulary together, you can start playing with different environments and they still work. And I also chose this because it had so many problems being a listed project. You can see the very, very ornate ceiling. Even my surface mounted spotlights were not possible. We were barely able to hang the extractor. So what we did here is there was a small picture rail detail that had a freeze on the left-hand side above the shelves. So what I asked was, could that same picture rail go across the beam and we repeat the freeze so I could create a coffer for the whole kitchen to create the ambient light. I then asked for a downstand to be added to the marble shelves so that we could actually have a linear light there and then it was quite important to, to select the material to be honed so that it didn't reflect the light source. And so you, you must have worked closely with, with Louise Bradley to, to actually select then 
the type of stone that she was going to use in order to to make sure that you were achieving the um the lighting effect you were after well the interesting thing that one gets with working with any interior designer or architect is finishes matter i'm always playing with light a the color of the light the fact that one chooses an led with a high color rendition index in order that you make sure that the colors that you think are there are really true here if a polished material had been suggested i'd have asked could we do the trials on a matte or semi-honed finish because we all know that if you have a very polished surface it's like a mirror and reflects the light source intent intends intended and you just get a reflection of either a uniform light source if you've got an opal diffuser or if you hadn't got an, you know, an opal diffuser it would have been all the dots that are so unsightly mm, so actually just honing that material made the difference and gave a wonderful glow to the space and again that was repeated and that was what I worked with with Louise on that Cornwall Terrace you know the project in Regent's Park and so working as as a collaborative team is what's so important. But then what's really nice is that you've got the hone stone, but you've got the very shiny copper pots. So actually you're getting a wonderful popping between a very shiny reflective surface and something that's actually just a soft glow in the stone. And I think that finishes are what makes the place. And it's like when I said earlier, you as interior designers play with those finishes as do, do architects so that you get that contrast. And then I just have to light them well. We've got another question, Sally, from uh, Fiona Menzies, asking, do you always use the same colour lights? She thinks it looks like warm light there. And are there any occasions when you'd use something else? I always would use um, 27 Kelvin for my accent lighting because you tend to want those crisper. So they are the up lights. Uh, and in this situation also, here it was the up light to the ceiling and because this was a kitchen. But funny enough, later on in the presentation, I often use two four in bookcases to create a sense of warmth, more like the old tungsten schemes. And I always recommend that two four is used in your decorative lighting. So it's much more similar to your old tungsten schemes because if you use two seven throughout, in the evening, it looks fine in the day. I feel it doesn't give you that warm, inviting feel at night. It looks a bit nuclear, doesn't it? So, and this was just leading to breakfast and dining areas. And I just thought I'd put it on because here you can see that actually we've, two, we've got two colours for that uplighting effect. So it was whiter during the day for the uplighting of the, of the ceiling of the kitchen. But actually we could switch to a warmer colour in the evening. And here we've got, we're walking into the breakfast room and it's framed. And this was a room again with no down lights in the ceiling. And it's framed by these two fabulous glazed cabinets. But in order to give them a lightness, Louise didn't want the sides to be solid. So therefore we kept all the lighting to the rear of the unit that grazed across in a vertical set, giving it a, a backlight effect, which I think also extends the feeling of space. And as we look the other way, we get, you can see the units were on either side of you, you've got the breakfast room, and we've got a bonquette, two wall lights, we've got the pendants over the breakfast room table, and actually now I wish we'd somehow incorporated a small down light as well, just to feature onto the center. We've also got three down lighters built into the bulkhead at the back, and an idea that I had subsequently was that that's got quite shaft scallops of light which catches the paintings but if you wanted to avoid those scallops and you had it as an antique mirror you then would have lost those altogether but still had the glamour of having that other layer of light and we've continued with the idea of uplighting the shadow of the shutter boxes that just gives you width to the room and now going into the more formal dining area this is actually um from a different project but i it illustrates my point so perfectly of why i'm so desperate for that central focus and now with do you see the difference it's made so here is your traditional lighting wall lights a chandelier 
And actually there is a small down lighter catching on the picture. But look what a difference, those two spots either side to focus on the center of the dining table. It's with a narrow beam 10 degrees so you don't get light onto your face. And then just creating the depth with the shutter box. Why would you want to avoid getting light onto the face of the diners? Because if you're like me, sitting under a down light is a no-no. It feels uncomfortable. Um, I'm so, one of the things, one of our other things at John Cullen is, we, we hate grids of light because grids of light tend to be, it's not like an office. You should put the light where it's required. People don't sit and look at a grid of light. They, what they look as you come into a room, you look at the elevation or the space. So when you come into the room, you're not noticing the grid of light. What you're noticing, does the light relate to what you're looking at? And that's what's important. And the idea of light over your face and the shadows of your, on your eyes and the nose and your face just feels uncomfortable. So for me, any lighting over the table, the coffee table should be narrow beam. I never, I try to, minimize the light over a sofa, but I will have directional lights to light the picture behind you, so then you get the reflected light. So those are some of the challenges. Amazing. Um, we've gone upstairs to the Piano Nobili, um, a double reception room, and that was one of the rooms where any, uh, we ha weren't allowed to have any of my lighting in the center of the space. I probably would have liked it here, you can see for the coffee table. We were allowed to up light the fireplace because the hearth was new. And I think that gives a very glamorous feel to the fireplace. I love the wall lights giving you that mid light. The pendant, the chandelier is dimmed so you don't get too much brightness. We've also got that other element of light giving you that infill, which is the actual lighting of the shelves. We've then got picture lights as our solution for the artwork. You can see on the right hand side and also the piece of art over the fireplace. And in order to give balance to that, the up light to the shutter box. And I think that you can see so many different layers of light and probably your old traditional solution would have been just one chandelier, but it's the layers that make the difference. And I just wanted to hit this to a very contemporary um, situation, how just down lights alone don't give you what you want. And there wasn't room for lamps, but lighting the shelves and dimming the down lights made the appearance so much softer. And this was using lighting to the shelves, but in this instance, we used it at the back as opposed to this instance, sorry, this instance, where they were at the front of the shelves. So what sort of fitting have you used at the front of the shelves? Because I can't see a light fitting there. I might show you that in a detail that I'm going to okay. share with you a little Great. bit later. Perfect. But I think that um, what I'm sharing right now, and I just thought it was interesting here, was, again, it's not the same house, but I wanted to show you that small surface spotlight where you can see on the right-hand side, the artwork is not lit, but you can see on the left-hand side it is, and you hardly notice when it's directed away from you, the spot in the ceiling. And how I wanted to pick up the light um, on the coffee table, do you see the flowers not lit and then the difference it makes. And visually when you're in that room, you're never really looking at the ceiling. And actually if a chandelier, this room hasn't got a pendant or chandelier was also there, that would have further concealed the fitting by your feeling being distracted by the chandelier. The other thing I thought was interesting was the shelving there was an existing shelving of brass shelves with marble, and I wanted to get lighting to them. So we brought lighting up the front and added small L-shaped brass profiles to the front of each of the marble shelves to conceal the LED at the front. And we applied the LED to the back of the marble shelves so they gave the backlight as well. So suddenly there was this fabulous glow in that room that gave the feeling of lamp light, but makes you feel there's a bit of a modern twist to the traditional furniture in the space. And again, the shutters were uplit and you can see from the right to the left, the difference it makes in the, the accent lighting being added.
now going to the study, um, here you see detail into the front of the shelf is the LED. And what's very important is that we get the, um, the lighting um, built in to the shelves from the outset. So we work very closely with the interior designer sketching out the detail to make sure it's not visible because that's the worst thing is so often you see modern um, shelving units where they've recessed LEDs, but they haven't thought what it looks like when they're on. As soon as they're on, you see the LED strip rather than the effect. And I rather like the idea here in the study of you've got the, the picture light, the shelves, and then you've also got the up light to the window. And actually something I wanted to ask you, both in this image and also in the previous one you were showing us of that lovely room that had the, where you'd added on the strips to the, to the existing brass um, display units. What would be your recommendations for lighting collections? Because often, you know, clients will have collections of, say, glass objects or perhaps antique book bindings or perhaps contemporary ceramic pieces. Um, are there different ways that you would go about approaching the lighting of different types of objects? Very much so. Um, sometimes it might be even the fact that they love their collection that might have been our first introduction to that client as well. Um, I, I thought this was a good time to sort of show you how we've detailed it. Do you see that the LED is very deeply recessed behind the, behind the profile? And this was really good for objects and books. Do you see how it catches the spine of the front of the book? And it catches the objects, but it gives a very even light. I'm just going to show you another solution to this. If you want to keep the profile of the shelf quite narrow, it's actually doing an up-down effect. So this is just an MD, MDF shelves. Where do you see we've got conceal the LED into the front? So it means you don't have to have a very thick shelf. It can be 30 to 35 mil and the light is a single LED and the light goes up and down and you can't see it at all. This has the advantage that it's also therefore catching on the base of the unit as well as the top of the unit. And that's just an LED strip that you've then put a diffuser top and bottom of? We've got a very small, we've got a, our seven mil strip, contour strip, recessed behind the front profile We've then got um, a V, we've carved the timber shelf into a V section so that it allows the light going to go both up and down. Amazing. I sort of call, I call it the um, bird's beak detail. We all know that, that's our colloquial name for it in the office. And talking about backlight, um, I thought this was interesting because we wanted to highlight the texture. So we pulled the shelf probably about 35 mil from the back wall in this instance to give the up light effect. So it brings up the texture at the back, but also you'll notice that if you've got a glass display, this could be a very successful solution. And often it's either down lighting through glass, but also backlight, you get this glow as if it's almost lit from the glass itself. Mm -hmm. And the other um, shelving I like was, that was an existing shelf unit. So, I was asked to light it so we could drop the supply down the back because there was a hollow wall and by adding an upstand at the back we were able to integrate lighting into that existing unit and I think that's what you've also got to realize sometimes there are solutions when you're not there at the joinery stage that you can come back and retrofit and finally probably the ultimate for a collection is we're just um, launching a Vorsa dot range where do you see the small Oh my God, they're so tiny. It is, it's smaller than a pen lid. Ah. It is a literally, I mean, it's probably the size of the first knuckle of my little finger. And you can see the small one on the books there. What there you can see just a line there. It's a, a little magnetic track that you'll be able to recess into your shelf and then magnetically apply these small little spotlights to light your collection. So that must be the ultimate. Absolutely. So if I had a collection that was growing, for example, you know, I'm collecting glass obelisks or something and I, I buy another one, I find one in an antique shop, if I can add another light in to actually highlight that without having to rewire or go back and start again. Absolutely. Amazing. Amazing. And we're also doing it so that you can create a flood effect 
or a narrow spot depending. So it's giving you the same flexibility that we, in, we need with our, our, our recessed down lights and the control is still there. How and it might be something you, you put at the front of us. How do you get a flood out of something so tiny? Um, with the special optics. Aha. So anyway, I just thought that is so lovely to share because that must be the collector's ultimate. What was that called again, Sally? We've just got it's the, it, it's the Vorsa dot. Vorsa dot. Um, we have a track known which uh, which is called the Vorsa, which was the small ones I was using in the living room surface mounted, but these are really miniature. No, they're amazing. So beautiful. I just thought the journey, the journey of walking through a corridor. I love the adventure. Here you can just see the magic. Most people would just put a couple of down lights, adding the up lights makes all the difference, then drawing you towards that dressing room. And here you can see the reflected light off the dressing room. And that too was rather nice because having just the lantern there is your traditional solution. We've got a spot that is focusing on the sculpture in the niche with the up lights behind. But actually there's such wonderful ornamentation on the doors and you want to make that narrow space seem wider so what it means is you can dim the pendant, but make the room brighter by the reflected light off the walls. But I thought how joinery is lit is so important. And actually internal lighting within joinery is now so possible with the variety of LEDs available. Just the way those shoes are lit by integrating at the earliest stages, the LED. And also I think what's rather fun is if you've got an open wardrobe and it's open hanging rather than closed, isn't it rather fun, the idea of having a diff something different to the back of the wardrobe and have a fun finish instead? Going to the bedroom. Here I think, I've chosen one in the attic because I always like to put a, and there were, we were allowed here to actually put lights in the ceiling. And there's a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. The dormer window. You want to add width to a narrow room like that. So putting the light there and catching on the blind. I always feel that in smaller rooms, it's the headboard that needs to be focused on. That's what's your, and the cushions. So two lights there help not only with reading, but they also need to be controlled separately so that if you are in bed, they're not causing that glare. And often the end of the bed with a throw is another area that I like to catch. I think it's really interesting what you've done with the dormer though, because actually you, you, you make the point that it makes the room feel wider. And it does, because you are emphasizing the widest point of the room and you're not actually noticing the fact that you've got the sloping wall section to the right of that at all. I th it's, it's something that I do a lot and I think is so often forgotten. And when one's using light, you're trying to direct your eye to the widest points, and that's why it's so important. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea here in the same room. And we all now need our home office, don't we? So integrated into the wardrobe opposite. We've actually got the little task light, but we've used these eyelids to give some more ambient light, at both levels, lighting what could end up being the files if you're doing homeworking, but rather nicely the two bowls here. And it's an interesting idea, but notice we did keep the idea of the layering of light. You just get catch on the stool, and I just rather enjoy that. And you can see the reflection there in the mirror of um, the bed behind. Keeping on the theme of small rooms and how you create the softness, and I just thought this was a really interesting thing. You've got the small pendant, you've got a tiny little bedside table. How could I get that feeling of the shade and shadow? Just floating the headboard creates the effect that a big lamp and a lampshade would do. And doesn't it get add a difference? The bathroom, the spa, I mean, there's no other solution than two wall lights either side that gives you your best light to your face, without a doubt. Here you can see in this main ceiling, we tried to, we've got the chandelier, tried to avoid the down lights, the speaker got in, down lights couldn't, but what I wanted was some lighting in the shower. So we, there was a dropped element, again working closely with the designer, that meant we could conceal the down lights behind. And actually that's also sometimes a good place that you could think of putting the extract. But I love the way that by lighting the back wall of the shower, you've brought your eye to the furthest point of the room. So the chandelier is your visual focus. 
that's dimmed and it's the other lighting that takes your eye around the finishes. And there's a low level nightlight underneath the basin that would come on at night on its own. Another bathroom, and I thought this was interesting with the lights, it's quite a small bathroom, but in this instance, using up light on one side to graze up beside the loo and create this indirect light with the little lights lighting through the glass shelves. And then on the other, the down light to the back wall of the shower, rather than directly over your head. And then a wonderful little light in the niche that gives a narrow focus. Oh, I love this image. This was not in this project, but again, with Louise Bradley in one of the coal vaults, the converted coal vaults of so many London houses. And it was a guest loo, and I just think it has the most tremendous ambience. And anybody who knows this, it's so tanked, you can't perforate to put any lights in. So I love the solution. And I have to say, this is not the perfect solution for your face. This is the perfect visual solution for the guest loo in that the backlight floating off the mirror enhances the curve. I love the dab double lantern. You really needed a light the other side to be good for the face, but this just gives you the atmosphere. And then the low level up lights that lights through the twigs presenting shadows on the curved vault. Well, I was going to, I was just thinking too, that sometimes the, the shadows are what is so particularly intriguing about this image. And sometimes it's the, it's the absence of light rather than the light that is the, is almost the feature. Do you, do you think about that when you're designing lighting schemes? Um, I think, I think about it all the time. I'm, it's, I, I play, I love natural light. I love natural light is an inspiration to me with the way that sun is dappled when it shines through trees and you get those wonderful shafts of light. That to me, I'm trying to take our narrow beam spotlights and do the same and not as well, not as well as nature does, but to an impact. So to me, what is lit and what is not lit is equally important. And you have to decide that on every project. You won't get the focus. If you like everything, it's bland and uniform. You may as well be sitting in an office, but you get draw, your eye gets drawn to different elements. And that gives you the adventure of the space. I've it's got two more questions dramatic. for you, yeah. Sally. Another on the theme of shadows. So Fiona asks, if you were doing shadow gaps at both the top and bottom of a wall, would you like both, either, or leave as a shadow? I've done all. So if the, shadow's very, uh, the shadow gap is very tiny, I probably would leave it as a shadow gap, gap you know, 20, 30 mil, because the light will be very sharp, unless you're using it as a directing momentum. If you've got a bigger shadow gap, you could do it, for example, on some very contemporary wardrobes where you might have them below the ceiling by 100 mil and above the floor by 100 mil, in which case then I would give, um, I might like both, in that you would be using that as your main light source, the infill light of the up light from the top and then the navigational light at the bottom. Um, sometimes it might be a combination. So the answer is, each situation will tell me some, a different story. <laughs> so. Understood. And a second question for you. Medina asks, would you combine different color temperatures in one room or is it better to have just the one color temperature? I play with color temperature. I touched on that before all the time. You can see the warmth behind here. I've used a 2-4 LED to create the warmth. I think um, there also is, the, there's two seven in the up lights, two four slightly warmer behind. And if you think about it, in, when halogen was around, and I lived through the halogen revolution, you could go from 3000 K to 2200, and you played with that at night. I don't think, I think if you do things in a considered way, you can play with color temperature. You can get tunable light sources now, but I don't think they work in every situation, which is why sometimes for the accent, I still, because I want it slightly brighter and white, I'll keep to the two seven, like the up light. But I want the glow from the tungsten and the lanterns and pendants to be warm. And from my shelf lighting in a room, by day you've got very cool light coming in, but at night I want it to be like firelight. I'll go for a warmer color temperature. So I'm considering that as part of the scheme all the way. So 
yes, you can, is the answer. And I ended with this one, and we've got a shadow gap to lead on from what you were saying in the ceiling. And here we've lit it, because in this situation, we've got a couple of narrow spots that give the drama of the space, huge areas of shadow, but an ambience is created because they didn't want any wall lights by a very diffuse soft light that gives you your soft ambience of the face from that slot around the mirror. And then you see the linear effect in the shower. And I know we're coming to the end of this presentation in my story, but every basement has or could have a swimming pool and a spa area. And I love the way this is those sunken courtyard wells that look so dull, extends the feeling of space to this swimming pool and exercise gym. That's incredible. Yeah. Really fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Sally. That was tour de force. I personally have learned so much. Um, and thank you to their audience. We're going to pass and see whether we've got any more questions now, Jeff. Yes. So I think we do have some more questions. Let me just pull those up. In fact, can we just look at this quote first, Sally? I do love Sorry. it. I should have moved on to it quickly. Just before I end, the lighting in my mind should be seamless at the end of the project. And the architecture and interior is the hero and the lighting just enhances it. Oh, I think you're doing yourself down. I think the lighting is the hero, certainly in your projects. <laughs> Excellent. But really, it's a collaborative process. Excellent. So um, if any one of our audience has any more questions, please uh, either pop them in the chat or use the Q&A. In the meantime, uh, Julia asks, in Sally's expert opinion, can you design a successful lighting scheme without spotlights and downlights on ceiling? and only using pendant lights, wall lights, and maybe LED strips, so more decorative, as it were. Yes, and I think I've covered that in one respect. So you can put the spotlights, instead of being in the ceiling or surface mounted, I've designed, and I haven't got an image now, I used one of the oak leaf chandeliers and put four of the mini bronze um, spotlights in it that lit the coffee table below. And then what I did was I had two lights, two control circuits going to the chandelier so that I could control the mini spotlights in the base of the pendant separately from the decorative candle elements. And there are some, there's, so depending on the pendant, you can often incorporate the lighting within it. So that would be way. I also think I use a lot of picture lights to light the artwork. And these days, there's a lot of, many more. We've just designed, in fact, a Wallace picture light that is quite slim and will actually light the full image of the artwork. And that can also work very well. And what's quite useful with that sometimes, if you want the picture light to disappear, I've even painted it the same color as the wall behind, because then when you're looking head on, because the picture light is usually above the picture, you tend to lose it against the wall you could then add your up lights to the shutter, shutter boxes and then the LED strips within the shelves. So absolutely. Anything is possible. And a question from Dimitri, could you please elaborate on how to avoid the light source being the focus as opposed to the area being lit? You mentioned that earlier. Uh, the idea, the light source should always be concealed. So one of the key elements, like when we use the pole spring, and the pole spring is our down lighter, which we do in various sizes, where the light source is recessed within the fixture, fixture by over 30 mil. So therefore, when you, unless you're directly under it, you wouldn't see the light source directly. So when you're under it, you do, but otherwise the cutoff of it means that you're seeing the effect that comes out to light the flowers or light the object. And that's also why it's quite important when it's narrow beam, when it's in front of you on a coffee table or table, it means the spread of light is not going into your vision. But I think too, that's, isn't that also the case that you just need to make sure that those fittings, as you said, have got that anti-glare baffle element built yes. into them. And so many of the very cheap um, ceiling lights, um, spotlights, don't. don't, they really don't. And so what you do is you look along a ceiling and you just see serried ranks of glare and it's like being on the Titanic. It's awful. We, and it's we, also... At the risk of offending anyone listening, we call that architect's lighting. And the re reality is I often get asked, because 
there is a, a thing that when the light is off in the day, you see a black hole. And it's very important that it's black. And I put, um, because when, if you have it white, which looks better in the day, but as soon as you light up the light, white battle, what happens is the white is such a reflector of light, it actually becomes as bright as the light source itself, so as glaring. So I've often um, been asked, couldn't I paint the battle white? But yes, if you never switched it on. So it defeats, the, it defeats the purpose. The other thing is that when you're tilting the light, you want to make sure the internals are also painted black. Otherwise you get the reflection off that. So just think of baffling the light source. And that's why so modern shelving units, you see the LED when it's on, what I'm always looking at is creating a baffle that conceals the LED strip. So what you're seeing is the effect, not the strip itself. I mean, there are other situations where you might be playing with visible architecture, you know, all these LED strips as lines and things. And I've done that in, a, you know, in gyms and I've outlined the line of an architrave sometimes, but then I'm playing with it as a visual focus, almost as a decorative element. I've got a six million dollar question for you here, Sally. At what stage in a project should a lighting designer be engaged? The beginning. <laughs> um, I can. I would say the beginning. Um, I think you need a concept first. And with people I've been working with, I'm often brought in um, at the concept stage where there's an outline idea of the direction one's going in. I often think then it's quite fun to have a brainstorming because I can probably add ideas to the party. I can suggest things that may not have been thought of. I can influence how the joinery would go. Otherwise it's when the concept is there, but before you're detailing everything, because one of the things we do early on in the project is we will give you that joinery detail before you've done your own joinery sometimes so that you might have done a quick sketch, but we make you build in the detail to conceal the light source so you don't have to do it twice. So that it actually works when it's Yes, installed. and I think it's <clears throat> important then. And we might be able to detail the idea of what the slot in the ceiling is. If you want to skim down your curtains, what you need to allow, not only for your, seat, your curtain trap, but also the lighting. So early on is the best. So, I mean, what I'm getting from this is that it's really such a collaborative process that, you know, the lighting designer is, is, is on that, is at that table right from the beginning. Absolutely. And right to the end. It's usually at midnight I'm handing it over when the lights are dim because you can't set those amazing settings unless you do it when it's dark. So I'm probably one of the few people looking forward to the clocks going back so I, I can start earlier in the day. Because otherwise you're doing your work at 10 o'clock at night. So lighting designers are nocturnal animals by, uh, <laughs> by definition. <laughs> Absolutely. Wonderful. Do we have any more questions? I think we might be done. Okay. Thank you so much, Sally. That was absolutely wonderful. And, and I think uh, any designer watching that will have learned a lot and been, been inspired as well. And I think any clients who, who can see the difference that lighting can make to their home. I mean, wow, what, a, what an inspiration. Thank you so much. Uh, well, we thank do, you very much. Not a problem. We do hope you've enjoyed this webinar and please do drop us a line if you'd like to find out more about John Cullen Lighting. In fact, their details are up in front of us now. Also, um, let's, let's also congratulate uh, Louise Bradley who did that interior design. And I think a, a big shout out to James Bolston who took those amazing photographs as well. What fantastic, fantastic pictures. Um, so please do, do get in touch if you'd like to find out more or have ideas for us to cover, cover any other topics. In the meantime, please listen to our shows wherever you find your audio on demand content. And do follow, like, and share on Instagram and Facebook. We're at Interior Design Business Pod. And on Twitter, we're at Int Design Pod. This webinar is a Wildwood production. Thank you so much for listening and watching.